Amen. Y'all just sang our special today, so that was good. All right. We're in the book of James, so we had the Resurrection Sunday, and a great, uh, great group last week, and then everybody leaves town, but uh, uh, that's okay. They'll be, just pray for folks that are out, and then there's uh, some that are um, sick today, and uh, just we want to pray one for another in times of need like that, and then um, especially for Brother Rojas, he's one of our men that uh, travels a lot with his truck driving, and he had a stroke. Broke. His wife, uh, Alma, is always here, and she went to get him, and um, just uh, be praying they're traveling back today, and he's got to be in some intense, uh, intense rehab. Well, we've been going through the book of James, and I'd like to just do a little bit of review. We took a week off last week, and as you go through just uh, uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, thought by thought in a book, then it just guides you through to the messages. You're not really picking them, and and boy, this is a, it's a, a strong one today, but I'd like to review just a little bit, because back in chapter 4, we had the big contrast. I, I said that in my title. Because in chapter 3, that um, the question is asked, who's a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? And he wants us to show out of our lifestyle and our works uh, with meekness and wisdom, his, his uh, wisdom. And, uh, and so then it talks about, and this is a very practical book. This is a book, the book of James is, is uh, concerned about the, the lifestyle of the believer. It's about just how we live. And we have other books that are uh, more doctrinally positioned where they teach a fundamental doctrines of the, of the faith. But James is very concerned about taking those doctrines and putting them into action. And really, that's what the world needs to see. They need to see, they need to see uh, uh, teaching lived out. And so that's what James is concerned about. And he says, okay, we know, we know that the just shall live by faith. And a person is, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Who would want to go to a heaven where people are walking around, how much, I gave more than you, I went to, I never missed church, I did this, I did that. And that's not heaven to me, because that's not what heaven's going to be like. Heaven is going to be that Christ paid it all, Christ made it possible for everyone that's a sinner to go to heaven, and Christ finished work on the cross is the basis of salvation, not what we can achieve or work. But once a person becomes a child, much like a, 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 a child in a family, then as they grow, they have responsibilities and you teach them to do their chores and their work. And then the immaturity is that they grow up and they're able to function and work and provide for their family. And it starts over again. And then they have children and they teach them to be honest and hardworking and a man of their word, a woman of their word. And so they learn how to do their basics and they learn to develop, they develop into maturity and they and their works follow the fact that they were born into that family. And so um, that's what James is concerned about. And so we saw this great contrast about wisdom. We saw that there's wisdom from above and there's wisdom from beneath. And we, we spent more time on it. I'm just reviewing today. But uh, there is a way that seems right into a man or a woman. But the end thereof is the way of death. So we're going to get in a little bit to the point where he says we should pray thy will. So the Christian is not that we don't learn, learn some good things and uh, come to the Lord and learn some Bible and then act like we know it all. Because we should always be saying if the Lord will. But before we get there we saw this great conversation. Contrast. He said, there's wisdom in chapter 3. There's, um, uh, in verse 14, he said, he just talked about the wise man. He's endued with knowledge and, and the, let him show his works with meekness and wisdom. And then it says, but if ye have bitter envyings and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. 
Now that's a sad case. It can happen in churches. It can happen in families. Um, bitter envies and strife. And uh, boy, you know, there's times when there's inheritances and stuff like this, and people. I mean, boy, the the real the real uh, true nature comes out there. And he's saying that's wisdom from beneath. That's man's wisdom. And he said, I don't like that. I don't want that. That's not the place in the heart of a Christian. And strife and uh, uh, holding things in our heart. And then that little term, lie not against the truth. That's a very important term because that's something can be taken out of this one context about wisdom and applied, applied to all of our lives. When, when we have a situation, most of the time the Bible will speak on it. But there's just little decisions and little situations and little upsets that happen in life and bumps along the way. And here's what can happen. The Bible, will, it might not say something exactly that thing, but it'll give a principle. And then a person will say, and we're talking primarily here about a Christian, someone that has submitted their life to Christ in repentance and faith, then that person does something like this. I don't care what the Bible says. I know what I believe. I don't care what the Bible says. I know what I'm going to do. I am not going to forgive that person. I know what the Bible says. I'm mad and I, am, I have a reason to be. They lie against the, we lie against the truth. In other words, the Bible has a truth. It has a serious truth about, about forgiveness. And that person just says, I have a right. You don't, you don't know how much I was hurt. And it hurt. They, I was betrayed and I will never forgive. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says, the Lord says that if you will not forgive others, I will not forgive you. Now, I can't change that. I can't say, oh, bless your heart. You, you, they really hurt you. Boy, you were really abused. Or you really, you really got a short end of the stick. Or you, you really, you, they really, they really messed with you at work. And you have a right to go back and hurt people. No, you don't. You're lying against the truth. The truth says to bless those that curse you, do good to those that despitefully use you. We have we have hard time with people that we like. But when people that don't like us, the Bible says a Christian has a responsibility to go and be concerned about them and their soul more than revenge okay so he says you're lying against the truth i'm just i just brought that out because that should that could go forward with all of us find out what the bible says about your particular problem and make sure you submit to the word of god and to the lordship of christ don't say but i don't have to do that you see, I got a raw deal. That's lying against the truth. And then he says, this wisdom descendeth not from above, verse 15, chapter 3, 15, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. And I said, and, and then we see now what wisdom is. He says, but the wisdom that is from above, here's where I want to live. Here's where you and I choo should choose to live. This should govern, this could be like bumpers in our life, okay? And here they are. Verse 17, wisdom that is from God, from above, is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, easy to be worked with, full of mercy, good fruit fruits without partiality without hypocrisy and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace to them that make peace now you just saw a tremendous comparison of human reasoning and God's wisdom and we tend to we tend to default to our human reasoning. It's just the way it works. Well, they, they the man they got me. I'll get them. You know, I mean, it, it can be little things. You know, he, he he cut me off, and I'll cut him off. You know, and and you know, and and uh, uh, just. Uh, <laughs> 
I have a little hope that they're working on our road here. They've fixed it up on the south side and on the north side. They're about to, it's open if anybody didn't know that. But it, it's uh, fixing to be four lanes up here. And and then boy, they just left us like the like the stepchild in the middle with holes and bumps. And I've had people had flats just driving down the road. Just hit that bridge. It's kind of bumpy there. Go go easy over it. But the right side, they started working on it. So out here where we live, we always ride on the right side of the road no matter which way we're going I mean if we're coming this way we're on the left side of the road because it's smoother they, they got that done and they quit working so they started grading I think they're going to do something please do something Lord help them to do something but the right side has at least got the base in it so I'm over on the I'm, I'm going on the wrong side of the road until I got a car coming and I pull over and boy when we first started doing that one guy, when I pulled over, he got over in front of me. I'll drive in front of you. Like, you know, I'll run, I'll head, I'll, I'll do a head on to you. If you're going to ride mine, I'll ride in yours. I'm going, I just went, what? And now after we've had to live with it for about a year, I think they got it figured out that most people drive on the better side until a car comes. But you know, they'll, and they'll, and this guy, this guy literally got over into my lane and tried to play chicken because I was just driving way out ahead of him. Wait, he wasn't there yet, driving on that one side of the road. See, that's wisdom from beneath. It's sensual, it's earthly, and it could even be devilish, okay? And so don't live like that. Don't live like that. But pure, peaceable, merciful, without partiality, the fruits of peace. That's where God wants us to live, okay? Let, let them have the place. Let them have the parking place. Let them, let them have the right of way. And, and you, you're a peacemaker. And then, boom, out of, out, of, out of nowhere, chapter 4 came. Remember, this is being written to Christians. He says, from whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not even hence of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust, ye have not. Ye kill and ye desire to have and ye cannot obtain. Sounds like America, doesn't it? Sounds like the world. Just fighting. I'll run over you. I'll get you. I'll beat you out of that. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll betray you if it can help me. And so, and, but the thing is, this is written to Christians in a church. And he says, you got the wrong idea about life. You're not, you're not right with God. And so, he, he kind of comes down to this very simple thing. That's the way the world works. Don't be a friend of the world system. Because if you're a friend of the world, don't miss this, you're an enemy of God. Hey, I'm, I'm going to get them back. I'll talk about them. I'll, I'll put a little jab in. I'll, I'll just, if they, if, 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 even in your families, I'll just give them a jab back. I'll just, I'll just, yeah, but you don't ever, yeah, jab, jab. Hey, just, just do that. But know this. At that point, now you may be a child of God. God loves you. Remember we taught in Sunday school this morning? He, he does what to all, that he, all of his children? He chastens his children when we act up. Because he loves us. So a true believer is a child of God, son or daughter of God, and we are chastened to make us holy. So he said, he's teaching us here, don't have these wars, don't have these battles, don't do it. And so remember how God helps us. He said he gives more grace, verse 6, he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. Just try, just try that. I would say try that. I, I really wouldn't say, I don't want to be facetious and say, just try the other way and see how it works out. You'll be unhappy. You'll be miserable. Your stomach will turn and your, your, your life will be out of sorts with the Almighty God. But if you will try this, find out what God says to you as a man, as a woman, as a child, son or daughter. Find out the will of God. 
And then you with meekness and fear say, I want to serve God in those positions. If you're an employee, you should be the best employee. You should not be going, yeah, 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 I'm bossing this and we're going to talk about this. And I'm gonna. I used to work at J.C. Penney's when I was going through college and I'd go into the, the lunchroom. I was a Christian. I was in a Bible college, you know, but I'd go in there and I'd sit down with my little lunch, you know, and I'd hear these people talking about their pastors. And, and I thought, how sad. If I was not a Christian and understood what's going on, what if I wasn't? And I'm hearing these people say, man, our pastor Sunday, he preached over 12 o'clock and he just talks this and he just talks, he tell a joke and he doesn't know do this. Or whatever they were talking about. They're going to paint the church white and I don't want it to be white. <laughs> Listen, find out what God wants you to do. If you want to come paint the church and you can paint it whatever the church chooses to paint it, brown or white or whatever, then get with a program and do it with a, with a good heart. But there are just some people who are never satisfied unless they're doing that yep, yep, yep. What he's saying here, there's another principle and it is an humble spirit because God resisteth the proud. Now, it's, it's all in here. I can't, I'm going to jump ahead here, but he says a little bit later, he says, now don't judge one another. Because if you judge one another, you're better, you think you're better than the Word of God. You're better than the law. And then he says, there's only one judge, and there's only one lawgiver, and that's God. So, how does that work? Well, look at there. Look at there. Brother Robert's leading the singing this morning. You know, Brother Daryl's not here, so Brother Robert, he just, he just waves those hands, and he just, he just louder than Brother Daryl. He's just trying to get attention. That's Brother Robert. He's just trying to get attention. See, I just judged him. I just made a decision in my heart about something in his heart. No, that's Brother Robert, man. If we just had a little more time, he'd just take off and start preaching, okay? Because he's just, he just got, it's in there. It's got to come out, okay? So you get to know Brother Robert and you say, that's just Brother Robert. That's God in Brother Robert, you know? He's excited about God. He's not showing off. He's not trying to be louder than another person. He just loves the Lord and it's coming out. But it's very easy for somebody that didn't know to say, me, 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 me. I just picked that out because I like to pick on Brother Robert. But uh, uh, he, uh, he, I, can't, I can't make him mad. He's okay. He's right with God, see? But, it, it, but people make decisions. Look, look at that woman. Look at that hat she's wearing. She's just a show off. I just became a judge. I just became above God. I just eliminated the principle of submission and meekness before God and became a proud judge. And folks, people don't need that. They don't need to see that in a church. Amen. I like what I heard one preacher say. He said, I went into church and the preacher got up there to preach and just as soon as he got to talking about something in the Bible, said, said this, this fellow over here said, Amen. I used to have two guys, they were, I, I almost say they're seven foot tall. They're not. I talked to one of them this week, Brother Adams. He's pastor now. And, uh, but there was Brother Amen and Brother, brother, brother Glory. And they sat over here in the other church and, they, and he'd say, Amen. And you listen when they said it. I mean, they were tall, big old guys, you know. One guy said, Amen. And other guy say he'd say glory <laughs> remember which one glory was that's brother adams and but, but this was the story i heard it said a guy went to church and, he, and the preacher said you know if you don't know the lord you're not going to go to heaven and somebody said amen and he went what what was that they don't say amen at work they say other things at work right and he went hmm wonder what that was he said, you need the Lord, glory. And then he said, heard a few more of those amens. And he said, those people believe what he's teaching. And they agree to it. But what sometimes they, they come in. I went into church one time. I went to a big church. And I was just a young preacher. And I, and I went to a special Christmas deal and I just walked around I got I walked around. I'm just a young young preacher and I'm a visitor and I walked through this church with literally thousands nobody ever said I haven't seen you are you a visitor tonight have you come to see this pro man it's good to see you oh you're a pastor oh man I'm glad you're here not one person 
Well, you know, at work, we're investing in this. And, you know, when EF Hutton speaks, everybody listens, you know, and, and everybody's talking about their investments and they're talking about their clubs and they're talking about their, their golf games and they're talking about this. And I was just walking around surveying the situation, a young, young preacher, and not one person said, hey, are you visiting? Man, we're glad to have you here. That didn't impress me. If you're talking with somebody, you know what I think it ought to be? I think it ought to be a rule that you cannot, unless you have a physical need, that you need to come in and sit down because you just can't, you can't move around much. That you should say, is there a visitor here today? Is, you know, like right now, where is brother? Somebody came up to me, they, where's brother? And I said, I don't know. I've already texted him. I don't know. He's never gone. And where's brother so-and-so? I've already texted them. I miss them. But I knew where everybody, just about where everybody else was. Folks, that's what people need to see. An humble and pure heart that submitted. Look at verse 7. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. If you've got a struggle in your life of, 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 of weakness in an area, it says here's the, here's the key. Submit yourself to God and resist the devil and he will flee. Prior to the verse, he says, not with a proud spirit, but a, with grace and humility. That's what scares the devil. The Bible says the devil is afraid of the weakest Christian on his knees. Because what's that guy doing? That little guy, that gal saying, I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to pray because I need help today. And the devil's trying to tell everybody else, you don't need help. You do whatever you want to do. Because you're the, you're the master of your soul. You're the captain of your ship. I used to, they used to do bumper stickers. Uh, there used to be one when I was just a new Christian. That was a long time ago. And it said, Jesus is my co-pilot. I don't want him as my co-pilot. I want him as my pilot. Amen. And then they had one that said, honk, if you love Jesus. And they'd drive up behind it and they'd say, I love Jesus. Honk, honk, honk. And the guy would turn around and go, what are you honking to me for? Or more than that and and they'd say whoa, whoa, whoa I better not do that one but then the best one was it said tithe if you love Jesus anybody can honk and so I like I like that one as a kid I, I was a young Christian I like that one but you see this is practical this is the reality this is where the Christian rubber meets the road this is what God expects from his children and don't come to Christ and don't say you believe if you've not said, I am submitted to the Father, I am a sinner, and I am submitted in righteous, to His righteousness because I am not righteous. And I repent of my own selfish ways. And I'm saying yes to the God that said yes to the cross. So now we get to another shocker, okay? And that is chapter 5. And now he closes by saying, we didn't get to point it out too much, but it says, but now ye rejoice in your boasting, all such rejoicing is evil. And he just, that's back to that pride, that's back to we're better than somebody else. Listen, we can teach the righteous of God and we can, we can, we can teach to put off the old man and put off old habits and put on good habits. We can grow in Christ without getting prideful about it. We can still be humbled that God is, but by the grace of God go I. But don't get that, Christ, that pseudo Christian, I'm better than somebody because I don't, um, you know, I don't, uh, uh, you know, smoke or chew or go with the girls that do. If, if God's allowed you to have victory over that, if that was a problem and you get over that, you're not better than anybody. You're just pleasing God. Because your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit and He wants you to be healthy and He wants you to do right. And, but that doesn't make us proud. We should be humbled that God allowed us to, to grow in Him. And He says, all that boasting is evil. In verse 17 of chapter 4, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. 
Oh boy, there's a sermon right there, but I got to keep going. And, and now we have this next contrast. It says, go to now, you rich men. You say, well, he's talking about them rich people. <laughs> he's talking about them rich people. Now remember, this is written in Bible times. If they, if they didn't walk, what did they do? They rode, a, they rode a camel or they rode a mule. Most of them walked. If you were a king, you might have a chariot. That's, that's more, in modern terms, a car or a truck. Amen? And most people didn't have it. You go to countries now, like my son is in Zambia, they don't have bicycles. They'll never get to have a bicycle. And they sure don't have cars. When we were there and there were 100 people there, there was one car and John's car in the parking lot. You don't really need parking lots. They just park in the yard where they play soccer after church. <laughs> but uh, they ride a bus or they walk. Because they'll never dream ever about owning an automobile. Ever. Just a very few people. So who are we? We're the rich man. You say, I don't feel rich because look, look, you know, I only, I only have a car with two car garages and three bedrooms and there's cars with five car garages and they got classic cars parked in there and they got 10 bedrooms and 12 bathrooms and, you know, I mean, that, that's a rich man, you know. No, no, no. That's an excessively wealthy person, yes. We're the rich. Don't ever fool yourself. One person said, if you ever have more than one pair of clothes to wear and one pair of shoes to wear and you get to eat more than one meal a day, then you're rich. So, with that context, let's look at the verses here. This is the Word of God. We're just going through it. Wow, it gets kind of strong here. And so first we're going to see a warning. Then we're going to see an exhortation. And then we're going to see instruction. We'll not get to the instruction until next week. But first let's look at the warning. Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. That's April 15th, by the way. And uh, <coughs> uh, part of it. He says, you riches are, your riches are, kink, are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them that of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire ye have heaped treasures together for the last days so the first thing is a warning about about possessions and let me say this other scripture teaches good patterns of saving and preparing and investing for the future and for uh, old age and for that is not wrong that is a wise thing to do if you're able to do it and Yet, there is a principle that's taught here that does not compete with proper savings and preparation for the future to maybe even have an inheritance for your children's children. Because that's all taught in the Bible and to be a good steward. But you never take a verse and make it the only teaching. But you do have to look at that verse. What he's talking about here is people that have allowed their, their possessions to gather dust. Or here, as I looked up the word, cankered, to gather rust. And so what that's, what that's showing me is that there is a warning for having something that maybe should have been invested. It's kind of like, you know, the, 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 the talent, the, the, the parable of the talents. You know, the one guy said, oh, he said, he, you know, here's a talent. And here's, you know, here's, here's three and here's five. And, and, and the one that had one, he went and buried it. And he said, he said, uh, uh, my, my. The Lord is a, a stern Lord and I might lose it and so I'm just not going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to bury it. 
But the only one that got the well done was the one that took what he had and increased it. The guy that kept it and hid it. And you can apply that to what talents has he put in your head and in your hands and in your heart. What abilities has he given you? What abilities through finances has he given you? Is there something that God told He never tells us. I mean, there's a few illustrations where he did, where, where they did give it all. But then God gave them back. He gave them back like the widow that, that was going to uh, just make her little meal and eat it and die. But the prophet said, you know, during a famine, God, God made it increase and gave her all that oil. But uh, she sacrificed. But it's very rare. There's principles about giving that does, that does not uh, violate the need of a family to take care of your family. God doesn't want you to give it all away and not have food for your family. Okay? So the, to people that teach that and cults that teach that, they're just off. They're just off. But there may be times, according to this passage here, where something should have been given, and we said no. Maybe that's regular tithes, maybe that's a special offering, maybe that's a need that somebody had in the church. Maybe that's a need that somebody else had that you know about, that God pricked your heart. But, but they kept it, and he says, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. And in other words, that, that rust or that dust that it will become will witness against us there was a need, and I didn't listen. And that's why I try to teach, and I try to practice. And, I, and I've tried to teach this to my children. John has truly picked it up and got it. John, John met a guy, in is, a missionary in Israel, and he said, he said man, their, 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 their ceiling's falling in. They have to have this really poor area because he said they've been, it's a tough place to witness in Israel. And, and he said they do a lot of printing, and they use their vehicle, and they bought it well, well, well used, and now it's just war, war, war out. And he said... He said, uh, uh, he found out he was praying about another vehicle. And so John called me and he said, I want to give some of my mission support. Sacrificially, I want to give some of that to that missionary. And I said, sure. And I, I can get that check written and we can get it to you and you can send it to Israel. And then... I don't know if it's always like this. It just seems like you sow and you reap, but you don't always reap exactly like this. But then about the next week, he called me and said, Dad, he said, there's a, there's a Toyota truck, four-door truck. They call them a, a Hilux or something over there. Right? We call them Tacomas, but they're, they're diesels. Oh, I'd love to have a diesel Tacoma. And they don't make them over here. And he said, there's one on YouTube where they, they, they blew a building up under it. They drove it into the ocean. They rolled it off a mountain, and they hit it with one of those wrecking balls, and they got in it and started it. It's, cool. it's, it's really neat. And it broke it in half, but it still started. That's what this truck is. And it was owned by Lutheran Ministry over there. And the guy that had kept it ever since it was new and done the service on it said they sell for $10,000 used. It's only got 150, 60,000 miles on it. That's not a lot. Mine's got 250. And it's not a diesel. And he said, I can get it for you for $3,700. Wow. And he said, in Enoch, my oldest boy will be driving next year. And that'll, but we need it for the ministry. And I need to use my pickup all the time around here. And he can really use one in Africa. You see, his gold was not cankered. It was his support, but he gave it away. And by the way, he does, a lot, he, he does love missions. And he supports missions through our church, even though he's a missionary. So there's a warning here. And then he goes on to say, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields 
which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ear of the Lord of Sabaoth. And that's the Lord, the Lord of the, the armies of Israel. That's our Lord God. And he says, you have cheated someone. You know what the Bible tells me? It says you better hurt yourself before you cheat somebody else. It said if you kept your word, you keep your word to your own hurt. And you better live it. That's what this is about. You better practice it. You better live it. Don't just talk it. Well, I promised him. One time my son had a mowing business and he was mowing, he was mowing down here, he's mowing Brother Hague's yard. They used to mow, Brother Hague had his mowing and they said, we're going to have a family reunion. We need it mowed Saturday. Saturday came a frog strangler. Pouring down rain. I said, John, we got to go, we got to go, Brother Hague, we got to go mow his yard. They got to have a, they're going to have a thing tomorrow afternoon. And so we're out there and, and I did the weed eating. I come in, I'm soaking wet. John's running his little Honda and the grass was thick because he didn't get it every week. He got it about once a month and it was really thick. And Brother Hague, Pastor, you don't have to do this. It's so wet out there. It's hard to mow. You don't have to do that. I said, no, sir. You've got, a, you've got something planned for tomorrow. We promised you we would get it done. And I taught my son, even though you're mowing in the rain with that nasty clogging of the grass, and it looked terrible, it got mowed to his own hurt. Well, I bid a job and it went over bid. Well, if, if it's reasonable and you got in a contract, that's fine. But if you said, I'm going to do something, you do it even if it hurts you. And that's what he said. That cry goes up to the, to the Lord. And it will, it will be on us to not keep our word. This is a warning. Okay? This is a warning. Verse 5. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth ye, and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just and he doth not resist you. You've been un... Christian. He said, well, boy, they killed people. Yeah. There's religious to, religions today that says, for my God, I kill you. No, that's not our God. Amen. That's not Jehovah God. And he's telling them. But, you know, in the New Testament, it intensified hatred and said, if you're angry, if you hate, you've committed murder in your heart. You see, we're back to that world's way, God's way. World's wisdom, God's wisdom. So then he starts exhorting us. And we'll just get started into this. We're just going through scripture. It's not a, this isn't the full, the full meal. We'll finish next week. Okay, we'll finish the book next week because there's some good stuff in the, in the instructions that he gives us. But he, then he says, be patient, therefore. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. It's like the farmer. They wait for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until the, he receives the early and latter rain. Be also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So the exhortation is, this is what will help you to understand. The Lord is coming back. Now to some, that's going to be a terrible thing because when the, when, when the Lord comes back, the Christian, the born-again Christian, not everyone that says they're Christian, but the submitted Christian to Christ that has repented towards God in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't say the one that has more works. I didn't say the one that's better than somebody else. I'm saying the one that is not, not saving themselves, but saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, humbled and submitted to Christ. Not perfect. No perfect Christian but growing and learning and, and, and stretching and, and, and hungering to be more like the Lord that when the, when the Lord comes back the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air 
He says, don't you forget. Be patient. You got life's happening. You got a chance to be upset. You got a chance to, to be judgmental. You got a chance to do all this stuff that he's talking about. You got a chance to cheat people. You got a chance to be less than your best. You got a chance not to give when God prompts you to give. You've got, you've got an opportunity for all of that. But don't you forget this. The Lord's coming back. Now, I didn't have a lot of opportunity because my dad was never home. My dad left when I was four. But I'd go visit my dad every now and then. And there was a couple of times where my dad said, when I get home from work, I want this done. If you want to eat and you want to stand, you don't want to, you, you, you want to be able to sit down, you finish weed eating that that fence. There was no weed eaters in those days, okay? These were the weed eaters. We pulled them out by their roots, or we had those <coughs> grass, 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 grass scissors. Oh, man, your hand. And he said, I'm coming back after work today. This is your job. I want you to be about that job. And I remember, ah, oh, I've been playing all day. I didn't do the work. I better go get after it. He's coming back. When the Lord rose from the dead on resurrection, we thought about it last week. Every Sunday's resurrection day. But we saw last week, every minute is resurrection life. Amen. And we're to live by the resurrection power of God. Not once like an like a anniversary, but like every day's breath. The power of the resurrection is how we, we can function. And he says, don't forget this. I want to exhort you. I want you to understand. I want you to remember. I'm coming back. And the Bible says those that believe that purifies themselves. That means, oh, Lord, I said something I shouldn't say. Well, right after I got saved, man, I cursed that next, that next week. And, oh, 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 Lord, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I know that hurts your heart. He's exhorting us. The Lord's coming back. So number one, if you're here and you've never just laid it on Christ, I mean, I'm talking, I don't talk, I'm not talking about believing it. I'm talking about like in marriage, submitting to that person. Like here I am, I put on your ring, I, I take your name, I live for you, I live with you, I say no to everybody else. And here I am, Father, I am coming to the Lord. I'm a sinner and I'm, I'm, I've lived my own selfish way and, and I've done it my way. I've had wisdom from beneath. I just, I react, I, I get upset. I'm sorry. I need your help and lay your life down. He died on the cross. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come into repentance. And when I did that, I became a little child. And here we go. Father, hold my hand. And what does he want? He wants me to grow up. He just wants me to grow up. He didn't want me to stay as a child. He wants me to grow to maturity. So where are you this morning? Are you his child through faith? Repentance and faith? Or are you a child that's saying, I need to grow. Lord, help me to grow. Respond to the Lord speaking to your heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this book. Oh, it's got some challenges. And oh, they're, they're, they're warnings and their admonitions and encouragements. And it's all because we're to please you, not ourselves, and we're to walk circumspectly, and we're to be submissive to an almighty God and have the joy of the Lord and enjoy our life on this earth. It's called an abundant life for the Christian that is faithful. It's called a chastening life when we're not. But it's a great life that will not terminate, but increase into everlasting joy. 
So, Father, if there's somebody here that's never said yes, I mean really said yes. Here I am. I'm willing to be baptized. I, that's not part of it, but I'm willing to follow you. I'm willing to stand up and say, I need Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God. I'm, I need it. I need God. Lord, you speak to hearts. And then for others of us to say, Lord, I... I lean back on the flesh, I, I default, I don't sometimes listen. I need to be sensitive in these areas. And I need to know that you're coming back. I need to acknowledge that and I need to be right. Lord, if there's sin in my life, I need to confess it. And I need to purpose to please God. Lord, I ask you to use this message today in all of our hearts. Be with those that aren't here. Be with those that are traveling. Be with those that are sick. But Lord, for those that are here, we're now responsible for this message. We ask you to speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.